I will. guys we're getting ready to get started with the mission in a few minutes so if you want to grab a snack and bring it with you to eat up here feel free to do that for my group who is online you have a link in the Facebook post right before the live stream with the handouts on it feel free to download those for everyone else the handouts are in the back we have leftovers from night one two and three so if you weren't here and you need those handouts feel free to take them and we also have two handouts for night four and a prayer card the handout from Pope Francis is different than the one you got on the first night from Pope John Paul II. So please make sure you take the one from tonight as well. All right, my online group, we're going to start in a couple of minutes. Go ahead and download those handouts if you're going to want to follow along with them tonight. Actually, my online group, the link may not be published. I'm going to do that right now. Hold on a second. Okay, has anybody seen my keys? My keys, yes. It has a chapstick on them. Oh, never mind. All right, good evening, everyone. Everyone had a chance to have a little snack? Awesome. Anyone need to go to the bathroom? Everyone's good? I mean, hot chocolate, coffee, sweets, Lord have mercy. Well, that's the best thing about being a priest. The rector always has leftover sweets from some function or other, so we're rolling. We're rolling right now on the rectory calendar. We had um, gumbo dinner the Knights of Columbus, complimented by um, bake sale by the Catholic Daughter, so we got a devil's food cake. I'm um, Father Eric and I have been working on. Proud to say we're halfway through. And then uh, we, I'm sure we'll have a complement of Christmas cookies to add to the mess tonight. So I'm look, looking forward to the next two weeks. I'll be in a dive bag coma after Christmas. So, Hey, no complaints here. Keep it coming. We're all good. We're all good. Santa can come by as many times as he wants. If Santa wants to drop a gift off every day for Christmas, fine by me. Once again, it's been um, so enjoyable to walk with y'all. I'm just going to kind of polish things off tonight. I kind of feel like we're just um, bringing things to completion um, with this fourth night. It's been so neat um, to see some familiar faces for all four nights. Um, thank y'all for y'all's um, commitment. I want to especially thank everyone um, online. It's been great to um, see y'all's comments and um, y'all's um, positive reviews for, for the mission. So um, thank y'all um, for joining us online. I know that um, we're always joining together in, in prayer and spirit for those of y'all who um, join us online and perhaps aren't able to make it to church. So thank y'all for joining for the mission. Let's um, continue to give a moment here. I see some people are still walking in and grabbing a seat. So I have to give a, a shout out once again to Miss Jessica for helping um, put everything together. Go around of applause for um, Jessica. Her husband's giving her extra. That a boy. A toast. A toast. <laughs> I also want to thank Father Eric for his wonderful idea to um, do the consecration. I'm just saying, Joseph, but to really um, finish the, the year of St. Joseph off well. Uh, for those of y'all who may not be aware, tonight is the, the completion, the end of the year of um, St. Joseph. Uh, our, our first night, we spoke about why we were having a year of St. Joseph and how St. Joseph has become more important lately in the life of the church. 
And so um, this is the first year ever that was devoted to St. Joseph. And um, on the Feast of Our Lady, um, it comes to a close um, tonight. So we'll finish it off well. Um, does everyone have their handouts for tonight? Yes? Very good. Everyone have their prayer cord for tonight? Great. It's a song. Another word of gratitude, Miss Jessica. Um, just beautiful prayer cord. Such a gift to have a prayer cord for each night. I hope you're able to use those at home. Okay, we're going to go ahead and um, jump in. So um, please join me um, with the prayer for um, St. Joseph um, Priest on our last night, dream number four. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear St. Joseph, you led the Holy Family in prayer and worship. You taught Jesus how to pray the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You taught Jesus to observe the fast, and you brought Jesus to keep the cup the holy days. Even in the company of Jesus and Mary, you were a spiritual leader of the Holy Family. Guide my family to keep holy the Sabbath, to observe the precepts of the church, to love the Lord our God above all things in our lives. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Of course, the prayer kind of tries to capture the theme of, of each night, and you can see some of those themes. Um, you know how beautiful that St. Joseph taught Jesus how to pray. Um, he taught him the Shema. On that famous um, Jewish prayer that they prayed every morning at sunrise and every evening at sunset, consecrating themselves to God and, and saying that they would love the Lord their God with all of their mind, with all of their heart, and with all of their strength. How beautiful the Jewish people um, said that together every day, the beginning and the end of the day. Beautiful reminder for us to pray the beginning and end of every day and to pray throughout the day. But we're going to be talking tonight a little bit about St. Joseph, about priest and father. Um, so once again, on the first night, we kind of focused on the gift of the marriage of Joseph and Mary, the value of them having an authentic of marriage, and the gift of their virginal love. On the second night, we journeyed um, with St. Joseph and the Holy Family into the desert um, to encounter our own demons and, and to pray for the, the grace of the gift of, um, of growth and holiness. And on the third night, what did we do? What did we do yesterday? We compared the Josephs. Okay, I think that was two nights ago. Was that two nights ago? All right, what did we do last night? Genealogy, that's right. Joseph as king. We said, I didn't remember either. My brain's fried, so I was hoping y'all knew the answer. We're in good company, don't worry. So it's jo Joseph as king, and, you know, someone else, you know, raise their hand and tell me, or, or all together, what did we say about St. Joseph as king? What did we say about that? Direct descent of David. True heir, right? True heir to the throne. You know, Joseph, Jesus, and Mary was the queen mother and true heir, right, to the throne as queen. Tonight, the one thing I hope that we walk away with, um, last night was that, that true sense of, of Joseph as heir to the throne and, and Christ the king of our lives and Mary our queen and that we're their humble subjects and we truly you know, reflect during Advent on all the aspects of our lives, all the categories of our lives, all the parts of our lives. And have we truly handed it all over to God? Um, because sometimes you know, there's an area or two that we're very strong in. And sometimes there's an area or two that we're um, you know, weaker in. You know, I'm weak when it comes to um, Christmas sugar cookies, you know. Um, I'm probably going to fail at that, right? Um, there's always areas that we can grow in. And that's what this holy seasons that are holy, right? That means set apart. We talked about Jacob's ladder, you know? Taking that next rung, that next step in the ladder of holiness. These holy seasons, Advent and Lent, are set apart that we can reflect on our lives and see what that next step um, with the Lord and the gift of holiness is. And, and tonight, I really want to draw us back um, to, to the, the Father's blessing. And, and what I want to like make an argument for tonight is that, you know, our, our role, our late vocational role as priest, prophet, and king all originated in the blessing of the Father. 
And, and so that's where we're headed tonight. That's where we're hoping to get to. Um, that our, our lay rose as priest, prophet, and king all originated in the blessing of the Father. So I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, we're on um, page one. Have our hand up. Rome number one, the fourth dream of St. Joseph. Take it from Matthew chapter two. But when he heard that Archelaus reigned over Judah, Judea, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Okay, so what did the first dream of Joseph do? Y'all tell me, what did the first dream of Joseph do? Not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife, be betrothed to Mary. What did the second dream of Joseph do? Go to Egypt. What did the third dream of Joseph do? Tell him he came back on home. And now we get a little um, more direction. Told him to come home to Judea. But then an angel appears to again, telling him to go to Galilee. Do you ever feel like you're not 100% sure what God's telling you when you pray? Well, maybe Joseph wasn't either, you know? Or you ever feel like God tells you one thing and he changes it? Well, he did it for St. Joseph and the, the Holy Family. So if he did it for them, he could do it for us, right? So, so we never know God's full plan. And, and there can be detours along the way. And, and that's okay. Because God has a wisdom um, to his plan. You know, Scripture says that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. You know, if you're ever just trying to live out your Christian vocation and, and your ministry and your prayer life and, and you feel God leads you one way, and then you feel like He's leading you a different way, and you're a little caught off guard by that, it happened to Joseph. It's okay. And so that's the third and fourth dream. And Angel tells Joseph in the third dream to go back home because King Herod has died. And then on the way, he gets redirected to a new home. Quote one from one of our church fathers, St. John Chrysostom. Do you perceive the alternation between relief and danger? Joseph left foreign territory and returned to his ancestral land, discovering the slaughter of the children in the process. Having left his household at Bethlehem, he again discovers remnants of his first dangers. He finds that the son of the tyrant is alive and ruling as king. How was it possible that Archelaus should be king of Judea when Pontius Pilate was in charge? Herod's death had recently occurred, and the kingdom had not yet been divided. But no sooner had Herod died than his son took power in his father's place. But if Joseph feared to make his way to Judea, they say on account of Archelaus, he ought to have been equally wary of Galilee on account of Herod Antipas. Let us leave unexamined for now the rest of the question as to whether he changed his place of residence or his every impulse led away from Bethlehem and its confines. There's a lot in that quote, isn't there? Probably thinking like, hmm, there's like three or four things I maybe just heard for the first time there. So we're not going to rush through it. I'm just going to kind of bring a little light to the details. In order to um, appreciate this quote, I, I cited Matthew um, chapter 2 right there. I was going to go ahead and read that and let you know why I included this little pericope from Matthew. Beginning of the scripture passage from Matthew. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Okay, before we jump back into John Chrysostom's quote, I want to mention Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 there, because these are little details that we may not be familiar with. Joseph, as we can tell here in Matthew 2, the beginning of his chapter, Joseph lived in Nazareth before he went to Bethlehem. 
So even though Joseph was of the house of David, which was in Bethlehem, at the time, his residence was in Nazareth. How many of y'all ever had to cho- change where you're going? Vote. You know, as a priest, I first, um, whenever I moved to a new parish, would, you know, register to vote in that new place. And then I found out that, you know, they move us priests around too often. So I was like, ah, oh, I'm putting back my voting district back where my mom and dad live, you know? And, and so it's like that, you know, like, I still vote back in Terrebonne Parish, but I might be in Lafouche Parish, or I might be in St. Mary's Parish, in my residence in the church I serve at in the rectory. But yeah, I still go back to my hometown, right, um, to vote. And that's what was happening to Joseph. You know, his hometown was Bethlehem, and that's where he went back for the census, when King Herod called the census. But yet he was living um, in Nazareth. So when the angel in the fourth dream appears to him, he originally was going back to Judea, but the angel tells him, ah, that's okay, Joseph. Go back to where you were at the beginning of this whole long journey. It's kind of like this journey circles all the way back from Egypt back to where he began before the census in Bethlehem. And so I just wanted to bring that to light, that Joseph was actually living in Galilee in the northern territories in Nazareth. That he had gone to Bethlehem, his ancestral lands, for the census, where the angel had been told him, right, you know, it could have been the case that the first angel spoke to him in a dream while he was living in Nazareth. And then they go to um, Bethlehem for the census. You know, they have the Christ child there. And then the second angel, you know, appears to him probably in Bethlehem, telling him to go to Egypt. The third angel appears to him in Egypt, telling him to come back to Judea. But then on the way, the fourth angel appears to him to go back to Nazareth. Of course, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Good. I'm glad we're all on the same page tonight. So, you know, we're going to have to move along here, and I know it's kind of detail-oriented, but we're just going to get a sense of things and keep moving forward. What are the two names that, um, you probably don't know how to pronounce that are in that quote. Y'all help me out. What are the two awkward-looking names in there tonight? What two names caught you off guard? Archelaus, huh? And Antipas. Antipas. Anyone know who they are? Yep, it's some of Herod's kids, man. Uh, we spoke about, um, you know, last night that it was better to be swine than one of Herod's children. These are two of the ones that lived, right? And so Archelaus and Herod Antipas, um, both, um, you know, sons of, of Herod. And so, remember, Herod oversaw a larger region. After he died, his children stepped in to smaller regions. And Pontius Pilate will come later. Um, because what's going to happen, actually, is that um, Archelaus is the one set over Judea, where Jerusalem is. And he's going to do uh, such a bad job at governing that Rome is going to remove him. They're actually going to exile him um, out of the Jewish lands because um, he was such a, a bad ruler. And they're going to replace him with Pontius Pilate. So that's how Pontius Pilate is going to be there for the years down the road when Jesus um, will be tried and punished. Now Herod Antipas gets the, um, the northern region. He actually wanted the southern region of Judea, but um, he drew the short straw there, so um, he got the northern region. Now neither one of them are good, right? They're both, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree with King Herod the Great. So that was Joseph's discernment. You know, as he's coming back, you know, he hears about the murder of the innocents, and as he's coming back, you know, he doesn't know what's going on until he gets closer to Judea, and he finds out that Herod's son is in Judea. And, you know, Joseph's like trying to protect his family. Jesus and Mary is kind of like, I don't really want to go there. And then we're going to get to that. I'm just going to kind of mention it now. But um, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to quote it tonight, but one of the things that, that happened with um, King Herod the Great was after the massacre of the innocent, innocents, the infants, the young boys two years and under, he became very sick. And it was an unexplained illness. And all the doctors in the kingdom um, couldn't explain why he got so sick. It was a very violent sickness. And it was of the um, gastrointestinal area. And it was very um, drawn out. And he um, you know, almost like starved to death in a way. And his organs kind of started to attack him. And 
it was a very nasty um, illness, and everyone kind of heard about it, and, and so it was kind of like, you could say, his punishment for his sins. But um, what happened was, his son Archelaus that took his throne in Judea, at first thought things were okay. He thought, you know, um, that this prophesied newborn king has been killed through the murder of the innocents, and now I don't have to worry about anyone, you know, usurping my throne. But then when he saw how sickly his father became, you know, his son Archelaus became superstitious and thought to himself, you know, this newborn king or his god or whatever it is is still around. And I'm not safe. My throne isn't secure. There's still a threat out there. So Archelaus became wicked like his father Herod the Great was. And so that's why Joseph is afraid to go into Judea. And um, that's why the angel appears or, you know, in his dream appears to Joseph and directs him to go to Galilee and Nazareth. You may flip the page. I'm just got um, three um, scriptural quotes here. Um, I'm not going to go in depth into them. I just want to mention them because each one of them um, gives us scriptural evidence that Jesus was raised in Nazareth. Matthew chapter 21, verse 11. And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. John chapter 1, verses 45 through 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. So I just kind of want to mention on these three quotes just to um, give that scripture evidence that Jesus was raised in Nazareth. And now I'm going to read from you um, a quote from St. Jerome. And we'll um, be able to talk a little bit about what was the symbolism of Jesus being raised in Nazareth and what um, you know, meaning did that carry. So under Roman number four, Opening quote. And this could have been found in the scriptures. He never would have said, because it has been spoken by the prophets. But he would rather have spoken more plainly, because it has been spoken by a prophet. As it is now, in speaking of prophets in general, it was shown that he has not taken the specific words, but rather the sense from the scriptures. Nazarene is understood as holy. Every scripture attests that the, <clears throat> that the Lord was to be holy. We can also speak in another way of what was written in Hebrew, in Isaiah. A branch will blossom from the root of Jesse, a Nazarene from his root. That last line there is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. A branch will be blossomed from the root of Jesse, a Nazarene from his root. Some translations say a Nazarene, and some translations say a branch. But the, um, the root word for um, branch, I'm trying to check my little notes here. The root word for branch in Hebrew is netzer, is netzer, and it's the same root word for Nazarene. So when scholars interpret the passage, it's the same Hebrew root word, netzer, for branch and Nazarene, so sometimes it's translated a branch from his roots, and sometimes a Nazarene. And so we kind of see two um, prophetic fulfillments at work. You know, one was that a branch will blossom from the root of Jesse, a Nazarene from his root. So it's kind of a prophecy that the Messiah uh, would be there um, in Nazareth. And of course, we hear, you know, the prophets say that can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, Nazareth is a very, very small town, and so some scholars say that there literally may have been only a few hundred people total 
you know, maybe like 50 families, you know, living there. And, and so, you know, if we think about what we talked about last night, you know, St. Joseph being that hidden king and even knowing his royal lineage and what that meant for his son Jesus and, and how King Herod was seeking the life of his son, you can imagine that it was part of Joseph's um, wisdom to go to Nazareth or the wisdom of the angel, right? God's plan. Kind of hide out, right? They don't come looking for you in little towns, right? They think a king is going to go to the city, to, you know, to Jerusalem to claim the throne. So, you know, part of God's providence, the Holy Family is brought into the smallest of towns to kind of, you know, hide until Jesus is ready um, to begin his public ministry. But the word um, Nazarene, you know, where else do we see that word? We see it with the Nazarites, right? If you think of Samson, you remember Samson from the scriptures that he was a Nazarite. What did the Nazarites do? They would shave their heads, right? Um, and they wouldn't take, you know, strong drink. And they would grow out their beards. They had these different disciplines that they did. And they were set apart. Um, they would be set apart um, as servants of God um, in the Old Testament and salvation story. So they were exceptionally holy. And so just... Um, this kind of the spiritual meaning of Jesus being raised in Nazareth as the church fathers and scripture scholars interpret is that the word Nazarene had connotations of holiness and that God, of course, you know, Jesus Christ was exceptionally called to be holy. And, you know, each one of us um, receives the call of holiness, right? And I think that was one of the great benefits of the um, Second Vatican Council was that it clearly articulated a universal call um, to holiness. You know, Second Vatican Council tried to wake us up to say it's not just the priests and the religious, you know, up there in the sanctuary that are called to be true disciples, you know, to live out the scripture that says, you know, be perfect as my heavenly father is perfect. But we all are called in the universal call to holiness. And kind of as we, you know, journey through this Advent retreat, this Advent time together, one of the ways that we can reflect on our call to holiness is the gift of our state of life, the gift of our vocation. You know, a lot of times we get caught up in all the different spiritualities in our Christian tradition, all the different methods of Lexio Divina, all the different ways that different saints have taught us how to pray. But what about the people who don't have all those opportunities to learn all these different methods of prayer? What about the simple person just, you know, raising their children and going to work every day? And I say the simple person, I mean, that's all of us, right? That's us, right? Just living out our day-to-day -day lives, right? With our families and work. But well, we really don't, you know, have to have this master plan of prayer. You know, the truest path to holiness is the simplicity of fidelity to our vocation, right? A lot of times in life, we're always searching for the next newest thing, the next, you know, best thing. And oftentimes, the best thing is the thing right in front of us. You know, sometimes people, you know, tell me, you know, some people have told me, you know, Father, you know, I really wanted to make it to your mission but I had to go to work, or I had to look after my children. I don't want to say, yay, you don't have to go to my mission because you're doing the right thing, you know? You're living out your vocation. Sometimes it's better to do that than to go to the mission, right? And so oftentimes we're looking for all these different things. But at the beginning of the day, you know, raising our children, spending quality time with our spouse, you know, fidelity to our state of life is our path to sainthood. You know, let me say that again. Fidelity to our state of life is our path to sainthood. And that was one of the beautiful teachings of the Second Vatican Council, really simplifying our spirituality. You know, as a young person, you discern your vocation, you got it down, you make your vows, stick to it, and you'll go to heaven. It's that simple. That's not overcomplicated. Okay, next we're going to look a little bit at Roman number five, St. Joseph as priest. I'm just going to give a little preface here. I'm just going to quote Genesis chapter two, verse 15. The Lord God took the man Adam and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. I'm going to come back to that. Now we're going to read the, um, I'll read the recitation here of numbers three, five through 13. And the Lord said to Moses, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and set them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister to him. 
They shall perform duties for him and for the whole congregation before the tent of meeting. As they minister at the tabernacle, they shall have charge of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting and attend to the duties for the people of Israel of Israel, as they minister at the tabernacle. And they shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are wholly given to him from among the people of Israel. And he shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But if anyone else comes near, he shall be put to death. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for my own all the firstborn in Israel, both of man and of beast, they shall be mine. I am the Lord. Continuing on the next page. This is what happens to Levites. From 25 years old and upward, they shall go in to perform the work and the service of the tent of the meeting. From the age of 50 years, they shall withdraw from the work of the service and serve no more, but minister to their brethren in the tent of meeting to keep the charge, and they shall not do service. Thus shall they do to Levites in assigning their duties. All right, if I can have y'all's attention on me, I kind of want to give a snapshot of salvation history and make a few comments. Our salvation history began with Adam and Eve. When we began with our first human parents, Adam and Eve, Adam the father of us all and Eve all our mother, there was no priests or kings or prophets, right? There's this Adam and Eve. In a sense, we know the calling of Adam, right? He was the one that gave the name to all creatures. So Adam in his own right was like a king, right? Adam in his own right was Lord of creation. Of course, Adam was Lord of creation. He named all the animals. He had that authority. And since God said that, I've made all of these for you. And he named them. God told Adam in the garden, you have authority over all of creation. This is all for you. So Adam, in a sense, you know, is that king. He's also, of course, a father. He'll become a father to his own um, children and generations. But we also know that Adam was also a type of priest. In a sense, it's the father's blessing that is also the priestly blessing. And these um, quotes we just had from the book of Numbers, I spoke about the Levitical priesthood. I want to draw a connection between Adam and the Levitical priesthood. So the two quotes I had included there, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, and Numbers chapter 3, verses 5 through 13, have something very unique in common in their etymology. And it's what's noted on, the, um, on that next page, under Numbers 8, 24 to 26, um, those two Hebrew words I typed for you, um, Abad and Shamor. Um, Abad and Shamor. Um, these two Hebrew words are only found in two places in the entire Old Testament. In Genesis 2.15 and Numbers 3.5-13. It's the only two places in the entire Old Testament those two words are found. Abad and Shemor. Abad means to till or to serve. And Shemor means to keep or to guard. So the scripture uses the word Abad and Shemor to till and to keep the garden. The garden of Eden. So when Adam's first created, you know, God commands him to till the Garden of Eden and to keep it, Abad and Shemor. Then fast forward to the time of the Levitical priesthood, and God commands the Levitical priests to Amor and Shemor, the temple. In a sense, the Garden of Eden was that first sanctuary of life. The Garden of Eden represented the temple that would be to come, it foreshadowed that temple of God's sanctuary. Scripture tells us in Genesis 1 and 2 that God walked amongst Adam in the Garden of Eden. It was God's home. That's where he encountered Adam. And it'll be in the Temple of Solomon where the Levitical priest encountered God. It's where Zechariah saw the angel, right? And so with these two Hebrew words, 
having only these two places in the entire Old Testament where they're used gives a very powerful message that there's this connection between Adam and the Levitical priesthood of Aaron. And the point I wanted to make, and of course it's not, you know, I'm taking this point from, you know, Dr. Petrie and other biblical scholars that have done the um, etymological and linguistic research. But the point here is, Adam in his own right, as a father for the first human family, also served as the priest of that family. Just as the Levitical priest served at the sanctuary, so did Adam serve the sanctuary of that garden of life. So embodying Adam is also the gift of the priesthood. And embodying Adam is also that that role of being a lord or a master or a king. So in a way we see the king's blessing already embodied in our first father, in Adam. But what happened um, throughout the scriptures? Original sin, right? Today we celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. We end the year of St. Joseph on this feast day. And of course, it's the dogma of the Catholic faith that Mary was immaculately conceived without what? Original sin. Without original sin. And so, what happened is, the more that we sinned, the more that we lost our identity and who God originally made us to be. And we saw that the sin of Adam leading to the sin of, of Cain and so on led to Noah and the great flood and a huge restart button, right? And so then eventually we come to Abraham who becomes you know, our father in faith and eventually we come to Moses. And Moses has just delivered the Israelites from their captivity in Egypt. And now within a few days, they're worshiping a golden calf. And so if we look back at Numbers chapter 3, verses 5 through 13, and we look at towards the bottom, it says, um, Behold, I have taken the Levites. So it's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about eight lines down towards the middle. Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine. For all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for my own all the firstborn in Israel. So throughout the Torah, and throughout the Pentateuch, and throughout the Judaism, God had commanded through Moses that the firstborn males of the womb of the mother would be consecrated to God. In a sense, what's happening here is God is saying, I'm establishing a clan, a tribe of Levi, and only Levites will be priests now. Because where else did it say, if a non-Levite touched their tabernacle, that he'd be thrown to death, right? So it's very strict now. No one besides a member of the tribe of Levi is allowed to serve in the sanctuary. Only those related to Aaron, the Levitical tribe, are allowed to be priests, Levitical priests. But was that always the case? No. God has to, um, remember what the Levites did. Remember when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the people were partying and sinning in the golden calf incident, Remember, it was only the Levites that had remained true and righteous. And so God commanded Moses to have the Levites slay all the other Israelites who had fallen into debauchery. And that's when God raised the Levitical tribe to the priestly tribe. And no one else, none of the other 11 tribes were allowed to be priests. But, but it's a fruit of sin. God didn't want it that way. His hand was forced. In a sense, because of their sin... The firstborn wasn't able to be that priest anymore for the family, that spiritual leader. You know, it was no longer just the father, no longer the male in the household or the firstborn. Like, like originally, it's like Adam and the first human family. It would be just the firstborn male of the family or just, you know, that father in the family that was the priest too for his family. You know, it's many years until we see a formal priesthood. But in the beginning, that wasn't necessary because the father had the priestly blessing. But due to sin and fallenness, God had to pick out a particular group that was trustworthy to become the priest because 
the father's blessing had, and his priestly role as father, you know, they had failed. And so God had to raise up a generation of priests. Um, does that make sense? Okay, uh, hang in tight with me. I'm getting complicated, man. So uh, welcome to my mind. Mm-mm. So it goes beyond that. They all realize that God never wanted there to be kings. Some of us have caught on to that. God didn't want kings for Judea, right? Let's see. I believe I have a scripture. I'm quoted for that. Let's go find it. There we go. I think on that next page on 1 Samuel um, chapter 8 verses 4 through 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verses 4 through 8. 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 8, right there on that page. And all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to govern us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people, and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds which they have done to me, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. So here we are. We've been in Egypt. Moses has delivered us. We spent 40 years in the desert. We came to the promised land in Canaan. And things started to flourish. We were starting to settle down as the nation of Israel and building a little commerce and becoming our own sovereign nation. And as we grew, we had to manage things. So we had the judges and we had prophets. And Samuel was the prophet. But the people say, you know, Samuel, Samuel, we want a king like the pagan nations. And Samuel warns them, you don't want a king because kings charge taxes and kings in prison and kings steal from their people, right? As comes to pass, right? I mean, that's, um, that was the sin of David. Remember when David did the census, God punished him um, for that, to allocate the monies of the people and to take more money for his royal um, treasury. You know, we saw the second dream of Joseph fleeing to Egypt was due to a census, right, um, by King Herod. In fact, did you know that King Herod was so preoccupied, like we talked about last night, with proving that he was the right king, even though he was a half Jew and an Indian man, that he built one of the wonders of the world. You know, when Jesus said, you know, lay down the temple and I will rebuild it in three days, and he's referring to the temple of his body, but the scribes and Pharisees responded, it's taken us years to build the temple. They weren't talking about the original temple that Solomon built. They're talking about the temple that King Herod the Great had built. Because King Herod wanted the temple of the Jews to be so extravagant and so beautiful and so magnanimous that all the world would be in awe and wonder. Um, even the Queen Cleopatra um, has been, you know, documented that she came to see this great wonder of the world, this great temple in Judea that King Herod the Great had built. Um, so he had really built it um, really big, but he was trying to, you know, establish himself, you know, as king. But yet, here in 1 Samuel 8, 4 through 8, we see that God wanted to be the king of his own people. God wanted to rule his own people. That like God wanted religious leaders to provide that leadership. But God did not want a secular king. But when the people start saying, you know, Samuel, give us a king like the neighbors, neighboring pagan nations. Samuel brings it to the Lord, humbly. And the Lord says, Samuel, don't fret. Don't worry about it. It's not you. It's me. So Samuel, they have not rejected you. They've rejected me. My people no longer trust me. You know, I've delivered them from Egypt and they still don't trust me. And I led them through the desert, fed them with the manna and the quail, and they still don't trust me. You know, I struck the rock at Horeb and provided them water in the desert and they still don't trust me. Time and time again, they're unfaithful. So God's like, I'll give them a king. And there's a few good kings, but there's going to be a lot of wicked kings. And so, I kind of just am pulling this together. This is a little bit of my own personal um, spin on things. But it's just my own kind of invitation for us to consider the idea that, you know, 
In the gift of fatherhood, there's the Father's blessing. And a domestic church that we build at home, every father in the home is called to be priest and king of his family, okay? Every father is called to be priest and king of his family. We see that back in Adam. Adam named the names, you know, the Lord gave Adam rule over creation. And in a sense, you know, he also gave the blessing. And, and God started to separate those roles due to our sinfulness, and so, in the beginning, that was not so. In the beginning, the father of every family was meant to bless his family and to be that spiritual priestly leader and to offer authentic governance of his family. That was what it was meant to be in the beginning, before that original sin that we remember on this feast day of the Immaculate Conception. But, lest the ladies fill out, let's put all things in a holy context. So I invite you to flip to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 and following on the next page, Ephesians 5. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. And of course, look at that last line, that husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And of course, we see that nowhere is better depicted than Christ crucified on the cross. Christ who truly gave his life for his bride, the church, for the Blessed Mother who stood at the foot of the cross, the prototype of the church, and for St. John, the beloved apostle, who became the first priest of the church. And so we see the motto of Ephesians 5, that the church is called to be holy and immaculate without stain, spot, or wrinkle. That's what we celebrate today in the Immaculate Conception, having no stain of sin. That each one of us is church. Whether you're male or you're female, each one of us is baptized into the members of the body of the church. And Christ, the true bridegroom, shed his blood for us on the cross to cleanse us. We saw that foreshadowed in the presentation of Jesus in the temple. Before Joseph and Mary were commanded to bring Jesus to Egypt, there was that presentation in the temple. And there was that first circumcision, that circumcision of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, our forefather in the faith, as a sign of the covenant that Christ will fulfill. In a sense, in the gift of circumcision, when the foreskin was removed, it bled. And it was a sign of the covenant, and it was a blood bond. The very organ of the male body that was the organ that gives life and that inseminates life into the bride. So that very place of the male member that inseminates the gift of life is caused to bleed through the removal of that foreskin and the circumcision. And as a foreshadowing of Christ crucified, that Christ who will inseminate his bride, the church, the Blessed Mother and St. John, to give birth to the church um, from the cross, that it will be that wound in his wounded, sacred heart from the blood of mercy and the water of life that will pour forth to inseminate each one of us with divine life until we too are wed to him in heaven. Because scripture says that we are neither given nor received in heaven in marriage, that we are all in communion with one another and in communion with our God. And so this is the heavenly banquet. When the priest gives us communion, we are the bride receiving of the life of the bridegroom that he may increase and that we may decrease. 
That's why we have the gift of the celibate priesthood and the consecrated religious life as a testimony to that wedding that we await for in heaven. But yet we also have the gift of marriage here on earth to prepare us for the love of God in heaven. I'm going to do a little um, role play demonstration. I need two volunteers. Dean, come on up. Jessica, you want to volunteer? Nope, <laughs> negative. Can I have a volunteer right here? Yeah. Melinda? You want to volunteer? Yeah, Melinda can do it. She's brave. I know she is. Come on, see Dean. Just stand right here facing me. Perfect. Good. Let's see, all right. I'm going to actually switch. I'm going to have Melinda sit, stand here. Dean, just stand behind her. Okay, right there. Facing, yep. Facing this one? Um, just facing me here. Here we go. Face me? Okay, get right behind her. All right, back up a little bit more. Perfect. Okay. All right, so Dean's gone. He's a good guy. He can play it off. So, um, so there's Dean. You and I are married, by the way. Oh, yay. Okay. So, husband, wife. How, how do I get to God? How does the husband get to God? Through who? His wife, right? And so this is the gift of our earthly marriage, right? You know, what does the word sacrament mean? The word sacrament means that it brings forth the life of Christ, right? Baptism gives us the life of the Holy Spirit. Eucharist, the very life of God. The word sacrament means that he affects. It brings about the life of Christ. The sacrament of marriage is a sacrament. Therefore... It brings about the life of Christ. How does it do that? Through learning self-sacrificial love, right? We spoke about your state of life being your path to sainthood. For a husband, he's going to find the fullness of himself in his wife. And a wife will find the fullness of herself in her husband. Genesis 1 says, A man shall leave his mother to be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Together, y'all are getting to heaven. Your primary vocation is to get your spouse and your children and your family to heaven. But there could be a lot of friction, and there could be, hold my hands, there could be days of tug of war going on, right? But you ultimately don't run away from the tension, but lean into it, because it's through this that we get to God, right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just some comments I wanted to make on the um, Ephesians 5. I'd also just like to comment, I showed y'all the Let Us Dream book um, with um, Pope Francis's um, kind of commentary, his little 200-page homily he wrote on COVID-19. But, um, you know, in it, he speaks about um, different countries um, throughout the world and um, things that he's seen in different governments and their response to the, the crisis. And he really, um, you know, lauds women, too. Um, he even names a couple countries that have female presidents and how well they um, have been very responsive um, to their people, how well they've communicated to their, um, pe their constituents, and, you know, how um, you know, well they've handled the pandemic. So... You know, I just want to, um, you know, lift that up, too. Um, it's a great read, you know, if you're interested. Um, I'm really enjoying it. I'm still um, about halfway through, but um, Pope Francis um, really also does lift up the gift of women and their um, role, you know, today in modern society, really embracing the gift of leadership and the great, you know, role that they play and the gifts and talents that they bring as we continue to move towards that greater equality in the modern world. Okay, let's go ahead and take a quote from um, John Paul II. I gave you all a copy of that. Um, the first night is my favorite reflection of St. Joseph, John Paul II, Guardian the Redeemer. We're going to give you another copy tonight. You may already have it. Um, Patrice Corday on the Father's Heart. And this is also the brief um, exhortation that Pope Francis wrote on St. Joseph when he announced the year of St. Joseph last year. So you have that resource to take home. We're going to round out tonight with this um, last um, quote. Um, the, the time's flown by, so we have about five minutes left. I thought we were like halfway, maybe. It's like, oh, we're done. So, beautiful. 
So um, once, one more quote from John Paul II, Glory and the Redeemer. And while it is important for the church to profess the virtual conception of Jesus, it is no less important to uphold Mary's marriage to Joseph, because juridically, Joseph's fatherhood depends on it. Thus, one understands why the generations are listed according to the genealogy of Joseph. By St. Augustine asked, should they not be according to Joseph? Was he not Mary's husband? Scripture states through the authority of an angel that he was her husband. Do not fear, says the angel, to take Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Joseph was told to name the child, although not born from his seed. She will bear a son, the angel says, and you'll call him Jesus. Scripture recognizes that Jesus is not born of Joseph's seed, since it is concerned about the origin of Mary's pregnancy. Joseph is told that it is of the Holy Spirit. Nonetheless, he is not deprived of his fatherly authority from the moment that he is told to name the child. Finally, even the Virgin Mary, well aware that she has not conceived Christ as a result of conjugal relations with Joseph, still calls him Christ's father. And that's in Luke chapter 2, verse 48, when Joseph and Mary leave and Jesus is lost for three days and they find him in the synagogue. What did Mary say? She said, did you not know me and your father were worried? Did you ever hear Mary say foster father to Joseph? No, Joseph was Jesus' father. Thank God for joining us. Some conclude the glory be. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Almighty God, bless you, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I should have some different resources. We gave you a few different devotional prayers to Joseph. We'll give you a couple of apostolic exhortations. You have your notes from the nights. Remember, there's different reflection questions. I hope um, this has been beneficial. Please um, provide um, just or I feedback um, so we can do this again and do better. So thank you all so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure. So everyone online, thanks for joining us. Bye.